Let's get some analysis on what's driving all of this, plus that move on Wall Street. Patrick Shervenek is here. He's the economic advisor at Silvercrest Asset Management, joining us live out of New York, staying up nice and late for us, Patrick. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I wanted to begin on what we've seen on the data front stateside, because I thought this was interesting. Surprise GDP contraction in the United States at a time when we have inflation tracking at a 40-year high. Does the headline number suggest that perhaps we have some worse things to come, or is that number maybe a misnomer? Just unpack it for us. Well, the interesting thing here is that uh, markets seem to shrug it off. You know, normally you would think that a, a number like that would send everybody into into a tizzy. But in fact, uh, there was some good news and some bad news in this number um, underlying it. Uh, the good news, let's start with that, was that um, the inertial drivers, the demand, um, consumer demand, business investment, all of that was either as good or better than it was the last quarter when we had 6.9% GDP growth. So that's good. The underlying drivers of economic growth seem to be intact. What's bad is that all, all of that was absorbed by two things. First of all, uh, an inventory drawdown because uh, some of that 6.9% in the fourth quarter was really a big inventory buildup. So there was some give back there and then a widening trade deficit. So a lot of that demand actually went not to US output, but it went overseas. And that was driven by the fact that we've got a very strong dollar. So walk me through the implications of that strong dollar. Obviously a role to play when it comes to the trade deficit number that we've seen, but what are the implications of the dollar index now tracking at what is a 19 slash 20 year high? So there are a couple of things that are driving a strong dollar. The first is inflation concerns in the United States that then would lead to uh, the Fed tightening. Um, but it also has to do with weaknesses overseas. Um, Europe really facing the brunt of a energy supply shock coming out of the Ru Russia's war in Ukraine. And then what's going on in China right now with the lockdowns due to COVID and the questions about how that's going to affect growth both there and the rest of the world. So we've got, you know, the past we, a strength in the United States, or at least up to this point, strength in the United States, which was raising inflation concerns and uh, concerns about Fed tightening. At the same time, you've got weakness overseas. So the rest of the world is not going to tighten in the same way. And then you get a dollar that's strengthening. And the effect on the U.S. economy is to sort of squeeze off some of that growth that had been driving inflation. And this is what the Fed is attempting to navigate as well, Patrick, because at the same time, you have not just the inflationary dyna dynamic in the United States, but some investor concern emerging that perhaps Fed hikes could uh, derail the overall growth narrative in the US. What does that mean for what the Fed is going to do next month? Lots of talk about a potential 50 basis point hike, some even talking about 75 basis point hike here. How will the Fed react to this dynamic? Uh, you know, this number, this GDP number kind of throws them a curveball because up until this point, the issue had been simply inflation and growth had looked strong in the United States and they were going to raise rates to sort of, you know, tamp down inflation. Um, when we get into a situation, it looks more like slow growth or, or maybe, you know, the, the inflation is already starting to derail growth. That creates a bigger problem for them. And, and also the fact that the inflation is no longer just demand driven, uh, which is kind of easy to, to, to tamp down, but it's also due to this energy shock coming out of Russia. And you don't really want to raise rates into a supply shock because that doesn't really solve the underlying driver of, of inflation. You, in fact, in, in, if anything, you actually want to ease rates so that uh, shale producers in the United States can get back into production and, and help make up the difference. So it really kind of puts the Fed in a, in a difficult situation here. So next month, 50 basis points, or would that look too aggressive now? I, I think that, that you know, the, the, the assumption there has been sort of thrown out the window, and we don't really know how they're going to look at this new, more complex picture. I mean, the, you know, the default is to say they'll do what they were expected to do all along, and we'll see what happens. But, uh, but, you know, 
if, if like I say, if if we're dealing with a strong growth, strong inflation environment, that demands a very different recipe than a weak growth, strong inflation environment. And and you know they just kind of have to sort that out. But I but I will say this, you know, from an investment point of view, um, I do not think that we are looking at a decade of inflation. I think we are looking at something. You know, we, we tend to look at. Uh, our lived experiences and our lived experience of inflation was the 1970s, which was a decade of inflation. And so people see high inflation, they think that's that's what we're facing again. I disagree. I think that the model that I look to is actually the inflation that took place after World War II in the United States as part of a difficult economic transition from a wartime economy, in this case, a COVID economy, to um, a peacetime economy. And that led to about two years of very high inflation, very painful inflation, but nonetheless, transitional inflation to a more sustainable growth, the kind of growth that we saw in the 1950s. And that's a very kind of different for long term investors like us. It's a very kind of different um, scenario than looking at 10 years of entrenched inflation. 